few days ago, I shared this on my Facebook. And uh, sometimes it can be dangerous to share things on Facebook. <laughs> and um, it's interesting because this is just a picture with purpose of baptism water. And here you see scripture. And what was scary is that I met many people who did not agree with me. And my comment was, okay, if you don't like this, then go to the guy who wrote it. Because I'm actually not the problem here, because the only thing we did here was quote scripture. But people have a problem with what the Bible is saying about baptism. Because we have a culture where baptism had been reduced to something symbolic, something you do as a membership in a church or outward sign that you believe. And I think every Christian, every believer think that of course baptism is important, but most people don't put more into it than is important and a symbol. But if we just take and read what the word is saying here, Mark 16, 16, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, say the one who believes and is baptized will be saved. Jesus also said that it, it, anyone who wants to enter the kingdom of God needs to be born again out of water and spirit. Peter on Pentecost said that we get baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. When Ananias baptized Paul, he said, stand up, wash away your sin. Paul was teaching Roman that in baptism we die with Christ and we are rise up with Christ. And we die to sin. Titus is saying that baptism is the washing of a new birth. Colossians is saying that in baptism we are buried with Christ. Galatians is Paul talking about that in baptism we put on Christ and Peter is saying that in baptism, that baptism now save us. How can we read that and out of that conclude that baptism is a symbol? If I read that, this is what the Bible says baptism do. That for me means that if you don't have baptism, you don't have those things. It's not like that. If this is what baptism do, if you don't baptize, you, have don't, you don't have that thing. How can you say that you are died with Christ and rise up with Christ without being baptized? How can you stand firm and say, hey, I, I have washed away my sin without being baptized? How can you say that? And it is difficult for us because of our tradition. How many here grow up uh, how many here in this room got baptized as a baby? Up with a hand. <laughs> that is scary. No. It's almost like being in Denmark. If I have asked the same question 2,000 years ago in the early church, how many was baptized as a baby? They did not do like this. They do like this. What are you saying? We did not understand you're Christian. Babies cannot get baptized. Because if you see it like Jesus was teaching his disciples and they walked with him. Then he taught his, and teach his disciples to go out and make disciples and baptize in them. Peter and the other left Jesus and did not baptize their babies. Their kids did not baptize their babies. Their kids did not baptize their babies. Their kids and their kids. And suddenly seven generations after Jesus, hey, let's baptize a baby. I'm thinking if that was what Jesus came with from the beginning, why should it go seven generations before somebody starts to do it? If Jesus had thought that from the beginning, they had did it from, done it from the beginning. And that came in with tradition. How many here, uh, you're almost the same hands, but who got baptized? How many got baptized with sprinkling of water? Yeah, it's the same thing. 
If I asked that 2,000 years ago, how many got baptized with spring or water or what? Because baptists mean immersed. That is saying, how many got immersed under water with springing of water? What? How many here got immersed under water with sprinkling of water? That is a wrong question to answer. The same story there. They did not baptize like that. They did not baptize like that. They did not baptize like that. But around year three, four hundreds, theology came in, and suddenly they came to a point where they believed that if you sin one time after you are baptized, you are lost forever. If you sin one time after you are baptized, you are lost forever. And there's no forgiveness. What did that theology do? That theology did that most people then thought, okay, I think I will wait to get baptized before I'm going to die. And I understand that. <laughs> so now people put at head baptism Onto that time, they were laying in the deathbed. That was why Constantine himself, he got baptized just before he died. He was sick, he was dying. Not because he repented, but because of theology. And it's not easy to get somebody who's sick laying in a bed underwater. So they built the theology, okay, in, in those cases where they are too sick, to come underwater, in those cases, it's okay to spring them. 200 years, around year 400, 500, it became the norm in the Catholic Church. And this is what we come from today, here in Europe. We do spring them. We are so, f we, we are so much in born in it, and we are so much part of our tradition that it makes us difficult to read what the Bible is actually saying. Me, myself, I came from the same tradition you, you came. I was baptized as a baby. My whole family was baptized in the Lutheran church. And again, I reason why babies should not get baptized. When I got baptized in the Lutheran church, they put me in a white dress. If people put me in a white dress today, I will open my mouth and say something. But at that time, I did not care. They could actually hold me naked in front of everyone, and I was just like, uh, I did not care. Why? Because I was not aware. Babies can run around naked. They don't see their shame. Adam and Eve was naked before sin came into the world. They did not see their shame. But suddenly when they came, when sin became alive in them, they saw their guilt and the shame, and they want to cover themselves. When kids grow up, they come at age where they became aware of good and evil. They become aware of sin, and those babies now want to cover themselves. My daughter, she's 12 now. I cannot go in. If she's taking a shower, I cannot go in and brush my teeth. Ah, go out! But when she was 9 and 10, she did not care. So we cannot talk about baptism that had to do with sin and repentance after they come to a certain age where they are sin aware. And that's why the only person who are never ever going to need to get baptized is babies. Okay. But I grew up in that. And my own journey was that I grew up in it. I got baptized as a baby, traditions. I got confirmed in Lutheran Church. You don't find that any place. But then later, I, I came to faith. And then I read, then I got baptized with immersion. But the church I got saved into, like every other church in Denmark and many places, was so influenced by the Lutheran background where baptism is a big issue. If there is something that divides the waters, it's baptism. And it was so hard to talk about. So almost every church in Denmark, if there is an area where they compromise, that is baptism. Oh, we don't talk about that. Okay, do it, but it's just a symbol. It's not important. So I actually got baptized, heard that it was just a symbol. There was nothing more into it. And to be honest, when I came down that water and walked up, it did not change my life. I did not feel anything 
big happen. So my experience in my world was this. And I started to preach that. You have to have the Holy Spirit. That is important. But baptism water, that is also important because Jesus said, nothing more, nothing with freedom from sin, nothing with bearing, rising up with Christ, nothing with a new life, nothing with the baptism to now save you. But then I, a conflict started. I had my experience in one hand, my tradition in one hand, and then I had the word in one hand, another hand. And I don't read anything here in the word that had to do with simple. It's outward sign. I did not read that the early church practiced baptism the way we did it. Because the way we did it was you came to church, you believe in God, hallelujah, now you are saved. And then one time every second month or half year, it's time to do a baptism. Who wants to get baptized? Because now we do a baptism as a party where people come in and we invite the family and people confess and they get baptized in front of the church. And then we went three months, four months, a half year to we have enough people and we baptize one more time. How did they do it in the early church? Did they do that? No. What we see in the early church that for them baptism was an importance. It was so important that they did it the same day. 3,000 on Pentecost, when Peter was preaching, 3,000 on Pentecost, repent and get baptized the same day. It could take some time, but they did it. Peter in the house of Cornelius the same day. Jailer in the jailer, jailer in, from, on the household in the book of Acts 16. They got baptized the same night. Come on, you could have waited to next Sunday at least. But they got baptized the same night. And we see the same again and again and again. That baptism was not something that came later. It was not like now you repent and come to faith. And if you are worthy one time in the future and we have enough people, we do the baptism. No, it happened right away. And a clear picture is book of Acts 8 when Philip, he was preaching the gospel to the eunuch. So as you imagine, here came Philip, he met a guy, the eunuch, and he preached the gospel to the eunuch. You don't read what he was preaching directly. <laughs> but what is interesting, you read the response the eunuch gave. The same response everybody gave. His response was, okay, I bow my he head now and ask this into my heart. No. You don't find that response. That is, today we use that. No, he said, okay, there's water. Can I get baptized? The response they gave was baptism. Not a sinner's prayer. Not ask he's into your heart. Not I want to be a member in this church. Not all of that. The response was, I'm a sinner. I have sinned. I want to repent and therefore I get baptized. And it was so important for the early church that they were actually willing to die for it. And the same today. Many people today around the world are actually dying for the truth of getting baptized. Not so much in the Western world because people don't die here or like that. But we don't see the importance. I, do you know what? If you go to a Muslim country or Hindu East East country... Many places you are allowed to preach a gospel where people come up and ask this into your heart. And you can do that with, with the Muslims leaders or Hindi leaders sitting on the platform. You are allowed to preach Jesus into your heart. Because everyone in every religion somehow believes in Jesus. But you're not allowed to Preach baptism. Because a Muslim, a, Hin uh, a Hindu, they know that baptism is more than just a symbol. That if you get baptized, you say no to their religion. Other religions know it. Satan know it. The demonic round know it. It's just the church who needs to discover it. What baptism really is. I sent my use. It's actually a guy we, we met sometime in Holland. I don't know if, if, if you're here, but I heard it also from my friend David Parson. He told that there was a guy who 
who was good friend with somebody, but then he got lost. And then some years later, he wanted to find his friend, but he did not know where to go. And as a non-believer, what to do? So he went into like an occult person, a new age person, and said, do you know where my friend is? And that person like, ah, I don't know how it did it. But <laughs> I went into the spiritual realm like, ah, where are you, our friend? And suddenly he's like, yes, I found your friend. You found him? Yes, but he's dead. What? He's dead. No. Yes, he died. No, no. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. No. Are you sure he's dead? Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm really sure he died. What? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I even got the date he died. What date is that? So he was looking for his friend, went into a cult New Age person, and got told through that medium that his friend had died, and he even got the date his friend died. So he left that occult person thinking that his friend had died. He even got the date. But short time later, hey, you are alive! You are living! Yeah, of course I'm alive. No, you died. No, I'm not dead. Yes, you died. No, I'm not dead. But I heard you died. But I'm not dead. But I even got the date you died. What? What date is that? Oh, this and this date. <sighs> I'm a believer now. That was the date I got baptized. The Bible says it's no longer you who live but Christ. Satan was looking over the world. Could he find him? No, because he was not alive anymore. He died. What day did he die? He died the day he got baptized. Baptism is not just a symbol. Baptism is so much more. And that's why there is so much fight against baptism against what it is and when i shared this a few days ago people came with the sorry the weirdest theology no sorry they came with the argument i hear again again what about the robber on the cross he did not get baptized <laughs> but i'm like sorry i'm so tired on the robber on the cross sometimes i'm like it's like every time we share the gospel what about the rub on the cross? And like, but, but I never heard anybody say, okay, but what about Kong David? He did not get baptized. Why do people not say that? Why do people not say, what about Kong David? He did not get baptized. Why do people not say that? Why is always a rub on the cross? Because people don't say, what about Kong David or Benjamin or uh, all the guys in Old Testament? Why do they not say them? Because we know that that was the Old Testament. That was the Old Covenant. That was before the baptism came. But we have to understand that Rob on the cross was also the Old Covenant before the baptism came. He could not get baptized to Jesus Christ because there was no baptism. Because the one who was going to start the baptism was hanging on the cross beside him. Jesus first needed to die get buried and rose up again before anyone got baptized to Christ because baptism is I die with Christ, I'm buried with Christ, and I rise up with Christ. Therefore, the robber on the cross, like everyone else from the cross and backwards, did not get baptized to Jesus. No one got baptized to Jesus. But everyone from the cross and forwards got baptized to Jesus. So where we need to look to find the true gospel preached is not in the gospels. The gospel, Mark, Luke, John is a between period. That is between the old and the new. There was things Jesus was teaching. He said, unto now you have not prayed in my name, but... He said, it's the best for you that I go away because then I can send the Spirit. He was saying to his disciples, wait in the city for the things God had promised. So there was things they could not receive, they could not do because it was the old covenant. And they needed to wait. You don't need to say to anyone today who want the Holy Spirit, okay, that's fine, but you have to wait here in the city for God to give the Holy Spirit. 
because he had already given the Holy Spirit. We are living after that time, after the time of the cross, after the time of Jesus ascend to heaven and give his Holy Spirit down here. And this is one of the biggest mistakes. So if anybody say, yeah, but what about the robe on the cross? Then I would say, yes, what about him? But he did not get baptized. No, he will hang up with other things. But he, there was no baptism. He was busy. But what if he died? Okay, let's say it like that. When you talk about salvation, we often think, we, we say salvation is if you do this, this, this. Salvation is actually not what save, it's actually who save. And that who is Jesus Christ. I believe that baptism is part of salvation. But if somebody is in China in a jail, he repent, he get the Holy Spirit, and there is no water. He cannot get immersed. He's in a jail in China. I believe he can do this. I baptize myself to Jesus Christ. <laughs> but this is not immersion. Okay, first thing, God, he can create everything. Jesus created the whole world. world. Can he create something out of nothing? Yes. Can he do that? It's up to God. He can do it. Do that mean that we today can then say, yeah, okay, they did that in China, I also do that today. No way. No way. Yes, yeah, it come once you down, down to one thing, it's Jesus your Lord, then obey him. You cannot play with him, you cannot buy him, you cannot do anything. If he tell you to do something, do it. It's so simple. Have he told you to get baptized? Yes. Yeah, but I think somebody in China do like this. Okay, who's your Lord? Can you follow me? We need to come back and say, Jesus has said it. We do it. Nothing more. No discussion. We just obey him. And we, if, I'm, if I met a guy hanging on a cross, <laughs> dying, yes, in that second I would say, call on Jesus. That is the only thing I could do. I will not start to preach baptism to a man who is hanging on the cross and going to die in five minutes. But nobody here is hanging on the cross. So nobody here have any excuse. Another thing when you look about salvation, but salvation, we have to understand salvation is not only about that split second you get saved. People think, oh, I can save that split second. But salvation is a progress. I thought for years that I got saved 5th of April 1995. I repented, the Holy Spirit came, I fell to the floor, I met God, my life was changed. And I was like, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm saved. And I walked around and said, hey, this is, this, this is what it is to be saved. And I was preaching that I was saved. Until six years later when I discovered the baptism and the freedom in baptism. When I experienced that freedom in baptism, and suddenly, oh, now I'm free. Now I'm saved. Well, what I really saved before? Because it was like getting saved one more time. I got saved, but now I got saved again. And this is what we need to understand with baptism. A clear picture. In the Old Testament, you read about the Israelites, how they were captured in Egypt as slaves. So they were slaves in Egypt to this world, and they needed to be saved. So Moses came and said, let my people go. Pharaoh did not want to let them go. Even in signs and wonders, he did not want to let them go. But they end up with the firstborn who died, and the blood came over. That is a picture of Jesus. By the blood, they were saved out of Egypt. So now they came out of this world, out of Egypt. Yeah, we are saved, we are saved, we are saved. They are rejoicing that they have just been saved out of Egypt. What is saved? Yes. They were saved out of Egypt. 
But short time later, Egypt changed the mind and came after them and wanted to kill them. So they rejoiced, suddenly turned to, oh no, we are going to die, we are going to die, we are going to die. So first they got saved out of Egypt. Now they needed to get saved again from Egypt. How did they get saved from their old life? They needed to get baptized to Moses. Because they went down in the Red Sea and came up. But when the old life followed them, they were all drowned in the water. And when they came on the other side, they were rejoicing and worshiping God. We are saved. We are saved. We are saved. They got saved one more time. This time from the old life, from Egypt. But the truth was those people who there rejoiced that they were saved, most of them died in the desert. And only a few entered into the promised land. Why? Because they needed to walk by the Spirit. And they did not do that. Salvation is more than just that one moment where you did that thing. For me, 5th of April 1995, I saw I was a sinner and I repented for my sin. I turned away and I asked Jesus to save me. And God came with his Holy Spirit. I got filled by the Spirit. I fall down. My life got changed. I stood up there and I have got a new heart, as the Bible says. I stopped living in sin. I was, I, 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 a new creation has started in me. And I was walking around, yes, yes, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm free. Jesus has set me free. But short time later, I start to be bound again. Short time later, it was like my whole life tried to come and take me back. And I started to fight with, with sin. I repented for most of it, but it was like there was things in my life that were trying to draw me back. I felt like something had a hold on me. I tried to live as a Christian, and then I fall. I tried, and then I fall. And my Christian walk was really about not sinning. Live holy. Live holy. Don't sin. Don't think. Don't sin. And it was like, don't think of an elephant right now. Don't think. Don't think of an elephant. <laughs> don't think of an elephant. Don't think, don't think, don't think. The more I'm saying, don't think of an elephant. That elephant, gray, gray, big gray elephant. I see there. We have him here. <laughs> don't, don't think of that elephant. Don't think of that elephant. The more we, we try to concentrate and fight, the more we will lose. Five minutes ago, nobody was thinking of elephant, only him. <laughs> but now everybody's thinking of elephant because we, we tried so much. It was my life. I tried to live a holy life. But I felt something was working against me. I have the will, the knowledge. I wanted to do what was right. But I felt something was in me. Like Paul is describing Romans 7, the good things that I want to do, I do not do, and the bad things I don't want to do, I do, but it's not me, but sin who dwells in me. That words have almost been the common words for Christianity today, that this is the Christian life. Sorry, that is not the Christian life. That is somebody who's lost. It's somebody who's lost. Go to Romans 6. We are free from sin. We are not bound to sin. Sin has no dominion over you. You are free. Jesus came to not only forgive our sin, he came to remove us, came to set us free. The problem with Romans, the way we read it, that we read from one line to another, but the way they wrote it was like this. So Paul is going to look at the old man and the new man, the old man and the new man, the old man and the new man, and show they're different. And in Romans 7 there, he talk about how it was before. But Romans 6 and Romans 8, they talk about the freedom days. But I, I love Jesus, but I felt so much like the Romans 7. I felt like I wanted to do what was right, but I couldn't. I felt it was sin who was dwelling in me. 
And I have repented. I even have got baptized at that time. But I was not free. Why? Because baptism, you need faith. You need revelation. You need to receive it. And I did not receive it right there at that moment. But when I came home, I was studying what the baptism was saying. I was reading, studying Romans 6, what baptism water is. And then I was studying one day and I was studying, sin have no dominion over you because you are not under the law but under grace. When I read those words, sin have no dominion over you. Sin have no dominion. But, but, but then I'm free. Free from sin, not bound to sin. Sin have no dominion. You're not slave to sin. You are free from sin. You can, but, but, but then I'm free. But if I'm free, I don't have to sin. Hey, I'm free. And I did like that in my office. I'm free. For that moment, that day, it was like getting born again one more time. It was like getting saved again. And it was so strong, so different, that I was like, was I really saved before? The first six years, I did not doubt that I was saved. But now when I was saved, I doubted that I was saved at that time. It was like getting saved again. And this is actually what we read in the Bible. You get saved, you get saved, and the one who keeps on to the end shall be saved. Yes, it should have happened for me the first day. If there was somebody who could counsel me, who could explain it, I should have gone down in this water. I should have come up again. I should have received the Holy Spirit. I should have spoken in tongues. And I should have lived that new life free from sin. But what could have taken one day took six years for me. Am I safe now? Yeah, I have the Spirit in me, but I know I need to keep on to the end. Can you follow me? And so difficult to understand because of that thing we are living in. We need, when we look at salvation, we need to look at what was it Jesus wanted to save us for. He did not come to save us from hell. He came to save us from our sins. It's not hell that's the problem, it's our sins that's the problem. Our sin who lead to judgment, Yes. But our sins, how did he come to save us from our sins? To create a new person. To create a new man. To give us a new heart. To wash us clean. Give us a new conscience. Set us free from the law of sin and death. And give us the Holy Spirit so we in him can walk a new life. That is salvation. That is much more than just believing in Jesus. Many people believe in Jesus and are lost. Satan believe in Jesus. They don't save him. Mormons believe in Jesus. Jehovah's Witness believe in Jesus. Many church people believe in Jesus and they don't save them. What is faith? Put your faith in Jesus. That is not to believe that he's real. So as you imagine, this is a big highway and I'm standing here and I'm talking my telephone and there's coming a big truck behind me and the truck don't see me and I don't see the truck. And I'm standing here and Fabian... My friend, he will look at me and say, Torben, I'm drunk. I will then look at him and say, I believe in you. And stand still. It will not make sense. To believe in Fabian is not to believe that he's real. I know he's real. I have, I have smelt him. We have been in Israel and Jordan together. We have been sweating like pigs. We have been running away from dogs who want to eat us. We have, we have been on an adventure together, me and Fabia. I know he's real. Everyone who walked with Jesus at that time knew he was real. Why? They saw him. They touched him. They, it did not demand faith. Faith in Jesus was not faith that he's a real person who one time lived. Faith in Jesus is faith in what he's saying. And if you believe in someone, in what they're saying, you do what they're saying. So faith in Jesus is to obey Jesus. Jesus did not say, hey, Tom, our truck, move. But he said, Tom, repent. Turn away from your sin. Give it up. And then, Tom, you need to get born again out of water 
and Holy Spirit and obey me. And everyone who believe in that, believe in Jesus, believe in what he's saying and doing what he's saying, they shall be saved. This is salvation. And there's so much freedom in that. We have a guy with us at home now at the Pioneer Training School. He came to me one year ago. A Danish guy. He came to me and, and he said, Tom, can I talk to you? He's around 50 years old. He said, I, I have a miserable life. I don't know if anybody can help me. I tried many things. I'm talking with a priest right now. I've been counseling, but nothing can help me. I said, okay, what is your story? His story was that when he was seven, six years old, I think it was seven years old, his father died. Maybe he actually got murdered. Maybe it was an accident, but I think he got murdered. So he lost his father as a young boy. Then his mom married a young man from Italy who was a Catholic, very religious person. But also a very hard person who did not know how to raise a family and especially a young boy. So he was really hard and he often hit the son. So he grew up with a daddy, stepdad, who was very hard, who hit him. And he had stomach pain every morning when he woke up and was seeing his stepdad. And every afternoon when he was coming home from work, he had stomach pain because his stepdad was there. Through his stepdad, he got introduced to the Catholic faith, and he tried to be a good Catholic, and he repented and wanted to live a holy life. When he was 16 years old, his mom died, but then he did not want to stay with his stepdad, who moved back to Italy, so he was alone at 16 years old. He very often sat down and wrote suicide letter because he did not want to live anymore. But he was afraid to take his own life because as a Catholic, that is the worst thing you can do. He tried to live an a holy life. He really wanted to. He had a heart of repentance and he wanted to live holy, live for Jesus. But his story was that he tried, tried, tried. But after a few months trying, something just exploded in him. He get, went out, get drunk. He was cursing God, he was swearing, he was doing everything, and he felt so bad afterwards, and he tried to come back. And he tried to live a holy life again, and after a few months, that inside him just exploded, and he went out and got drunk and cursed everyone. And he was telling about his story, about suicide, about that fight inside of him, and he was really open up to me, and had tried everything. And he was almost crying when he said it, it was hard. When I sat in front of him, listened to his story, I was almost laughing. I was like, and I, I need to say, sorry, I'm smiling. <laughs> the, sorry, but the reason I'm smiling is, you're going to be free today. And I said, what? You are going to be free today. I said, no, but I, I'm not fake it. I tried everything. I've been in church. I've been counseling. I tried that. No, but you are going to be free today. Of course, you feel miserable. You feel like Paul in Romans 7. Of course, you feel like that. Because you have repented. But you have never buried that dead body. You have never got free from those demons. And you have never received the Holy Spirit to live that new life. So, of course, you feel miserable. And he was like, but, but, but I don't want to fake it. No, but this is the gospel. And when I sat in front of him, I, I really reminded Paul's word. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because this is the power of salvation for everyone who believes. And I just know there is so much power in the true gospel. The true gospel is not only cleansing people outside like the Pharisees, Jesus said to the Pharisees, yeah, you cleanse the vessel outside, but inside is rotten and full of dead man bones. No, the true gospel is cleansing people inside so they also will be clean outside. And when I sat in front of him, I just knew that guy is going to be free. And that day what happened? He had repented. 
but he had never got baptized with full immersion to Christ and never received the Holy Spirit. And that day it happened and it became a new life for him. And I've seen that again and again and again. There is so much power in the gospel. It's incredible. I love it. But it's the true gospel we are talking about. It's the heart of repentance. It's the buried old life. And it's a rising up in Christ in a new life. That is the cross. That is the cross. People also say when they see this, yeah, Tom, but, but you are preaching baptism. What? It's only about the cross. Yes, it's about the cross. But what is the cross? The cross is this. The cross. How do we today carry our cross? How do we today follow Jesus' symbol? Should every one of us go on the cross and get crucified? Let's try that and see what you want to choose. The crucifixion or the baptism? No, nobody of us is going to be put on a cross today. How do we then do the cross? The cross is dying. Jesus needs to die. He needs to deny himself. And then he got buried. And then he was rose up again. And that is what we are preaching here. You die in repentance. Repentance is not just, I feel sorry for myself. Repentance is not, oh, sorry, I did something. Repentance has to do with, say, sorry and turn around and stop doing it. It's really say, okay, I was used to living this. I was used to doing this. This is wrong. It's sin. I turn away from it. I change my mind. I loved it before. I choose to now hate it. That is a decision. I chose Choose not to go out that way. I choose not to live in sin. I choose to turn away from that life. You repent. You die from yourself and your flesh. And then you get buried with Christ on the water. And then you are rise up with Christ and you receive the Holy Spirit. When Peter, after the cross, book of Acts 2, 38, preached the gospel for the first time fully. He said, they asked, what shall we do? Repent, every one of you, and get baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the Holy Spirit. This promise, the promise of the new covenant, the promise of the new heart, the promise of the new birth, the promise that had been prophesied by all the prophets, this promise, the new covenant, this promise today is for you, your children, and everyone God is going to call on in the future. And that is including us. When we repent and we get baptized, we shall receive the Holy Spirit. Yes, some of us already received the Holy Spirit before we get baptized, but that don't mean we should not get baptized. The only example where they received the Holy Spirit before they got baptized was Book of Acts 10 with Peter in the house of Cornelius. But as soon as they had received the Holy Spirit, Peter commanded them to get baptized now. He commanded them to get baptized. Don't wait. About the Holy Spirit, there is also a lot of misunderstanding because of our tradition. Because we have our tradition in one hand and we have the word in one hand. There is churches today in Holland and Germany or where you're from who are preaching Speaking tongues is not for today. That ceased with the apostles. Then there is churches today who are preaching. No, no, speaking tongues is not what you are doing, Tom, everybody else, Sheila, blah, blah, blah. We don't understand that. That is just words. No, speaking tongues is what we read in Book of Acts 2. They spoke and people from other languages understood them. So speaking tongues is for those who understand it and nothing else. And they have scripture on that. Then there's other people who are preaching. No, 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 no. Speaking tongues is not only language people understand. Because there is a speaking tongues, but you have to have somebody who can interpret. So when you do it in the meeting, only two and three at a time. And don't do it. Don't do it. You're not allowed to do it if nobody is not there to give the interpretation. And then there's people who focus more like, yeah, but, but, but Rome, like Corinthians 14, 2, Paul is saying, when you speak in tongues, you speak mysteries to God, and no one understands you. 
So this is the personal tolls. And there is different views, and that has to do with what church denomination you often grow up in and what experience you have. How do I see it? I see it simple. They are somehow right, they are somehow right, they are somehow right, and they are completely wrong. <laughs> because it is for today, yes. It's not only language, but it is language. It's not only to interpret, but it can also be that. And that is also the truth, but that is not the only truth. There is actually four different kinds of tongues. And if you don't have those experiences, you will get lost in the scripture. I'm speaking in tongues now. Tongues mean language. I am speaking a language. When you got born as a baby, when I got born, I got a tongue, a language. And I speak Danish in everyday life, but now I'm learning to speak English. Still learning. <laughs> so that is a tongue. When I got born again, Born by the flesh, I got a fleshly language. When I got born by the spirit, I got a spiritual language. That is that tongue Paul is talking about in Corinthians 14 too. I speak mysteries to God. No one understands me. It's a prayer language between me and God. And Paul said, I thank God that I speak more in tongues than any of you. This is this tongue we are going to see today again and again where people... We see the spirit and they speak in tongues. And nobody understands, but when you speak in tongues, you edify yourself, you build up yourself. It's, nobody can give me the interpretation, it's my tongue. Nobody understands, it's my tongue. This is a personal tongue, I believe that is for everyone who are born again. But then there is those two other tongues that we need to see more and more. This tongue is the tongue where we speak it and our interpretation is coming. We saw that in our last kickstart when we were in Norway. When we were doing the last kickstart in Norway on the Sunday meeting, I was preaching and God just came, the Holy Spirit filled the room. And a, a woman stood up, and he, she gave a big, big tongue and it was a different tongue. You just like, everybody became quiet like, Chew. and she gave that tongue. Another woman stood up, gave the interpretation. She continued in the tongue, she continued in the interpretation. She continued in the tongue, and she continued in the interpretation, and God spoke to everyone. And it edified not only one person, it edified the whole church. That tongue, we need to see more. This is part of it. Then there is the tongue we saw in Pentecost, where they spoke, and people from other languages understood it. I experienced that short time ago in Germany. Uh, when you live in Denmark, you sometimes go over the border to uh, Flensburg to buy some Nutella <laughs> and uh, Coke. Thank you, Germany, for your Nutella and Coke. <laughs> and I came to uh, a, a shop there in Germany, and I stepped out of the shop, and then a guy came to me. And he said, hey, hey, and he started to talk to me, and he wanted to beg for money, and then he started to talk about weird things, about internet and conspiracy theory and, and uh, Luminati and all of that. And he talked and talked, and I said, stop, stop, what do you want? And he talked again, I said, stop, what do you want? And then I looked, really looked at him, and I saw, okay, this guy is a Satanist. He was black from top to bottom. He had like black clothes, black shoes, black hair. He had contact lenses where his eyes was cat eyes. Like he had 666 tattoo there, 666 on his shoe and satanic symbol on his clothes. So I looked at him and I, I like, I said, but I'm a Christian, but let me just pray for you. And I put my hands on him and I cast out that demon. So I was like, uh, I just felt like, dude, so I said, come out in there, I command you wrong spirit, go right now. He was like, Ugh! and it was, it was funny because it was just beside where people are standing with the hot dogs and eating, and I like, <laughs> curry wurst, love it. And something just left him, he was like, Ugh! and something left him. And then out there on the street beside the curry wurst and hot dogs and everything, I just felt God came. 
And I looked at him, and I did something I've not done like that before. I just put my hands on him, and I spoke to him in tongues. I felt like, and I started to speak with him in tongues. I did not understand what I said, and my tongue changed. It was like, not completely, but there was a trace. There was something that was different. And I spoke with him in tongues. And when I was finished, I was like, I was thinking, what am I doing? I like that, like. What is happening here? And when I was finished, he just looked at me like, big eyes, like he had just seen God, and then he stepped back. How did you know? I said, what? How did you know? Uh, I don't understand. Who have learned, who have taught you our language? How have you learned our language? How did you know that? And I said, I don't fully understand. Me and my brother, when we were kids, we developed a code language only we understood. But you had just been telling me about God in our language. And when I left that place, you were standing and worshiping Jesus. In the early church, they knew about that tongue. They experienced it. I think on Pentecost, they experienced the person tongues, but also that tongues, two things. And they knew about this tongue. When they came together, somebody came with that loud tongue and there was interpretation. They knew about this tongue, the tongue that's for everyone that's personal, edifying yourself, everyone who's born again, get this right away. They knew about it. And therefore, when they read the scripture, they do not get confused. The same like many is today. Remember one scripture where I talk about a lot about tongues is Corinthians, especially 12 and 14. But Paul did not write 1 Corinthians to a Baptist church today, or Lutheran church, or the Catholic church. He wrote that letter to that church who already had that experience. So we today read the same letter but with our glasses on. And we interpret scripture out of experience and therefore we get lost. You follow me? And this is the problem today. So what do I believe? I see salvation as a progress. It can happen right away. It's still the one who keep on to the end who should be saved. We need three things in salvation. First, we need to recognize we have sinned and turn away from that sin. And in that repentance, God gave us a new heart. He removed the stone heart, gave us a new heart, write the law on our heart. We get a heart of flesh. The conscience becomes sharp. Shh, shh. <gasps> Am I used to doing that? I don't like what I liked before. Why? New conscience. This is where people often say, now I'm saved. No, this is where you're starting to get saved. It don't stop there. This is the beginning. Now the life is inside of you, but the body is dead. What do you do with a dead body? You bury it. If you don't get rid of that dead body, that dead body will kill the life inside of you. And you end up losing that life. So you die with Christ and rise up with Christ. And then you receive the Spirit of God. So you now can walk the new life free from sin, led by the Holy Spirit. And then the one who keep on to the end shall be saved. Do you get it? We are going to have a 15 minutes break now, and then I'm going to continue a little on this, and then I'm going to share the gospel to you.